It probably won't surprise you to learn that the library in Waycross, Georgia, didn't have a hell of a lot about atheism circa 2001. And keep in mind that the new atheist books didn't start to arrive until about 2006, and the idea of ordering stuff online was still reserved for the more technologically inclined. Amazon had been around for seven years by then, but 2001 was the first year they would turn a profit. It was also the year that Wikipedia started, so... You know, even for the 50% or so of households that had internet access, it still took something of a specialist to tease any useful information out of it. So for folks like me, if you wanted new information, you had to turn to bookstores and libraries. Now, Waycross, Georgia had two bookstores at the time, but both of them literally had Christian in the name, like so-and-so's Christian bookstore. So not only could you not find books about atheism in them, they wouldn't even order those books for you if you asked. Now, the library wasn't much better, but it was better. I had to search pretty hard, but ultimately I did manage to find one and a half books about atheism. One was called The Atheist Debater's Handbook, and flawed though it was, it acted as my first introduction to a lot of the arguments that I still use today. Uh, and the half book was a 1994 book called Creationism's Upside-Down Pyramid. Uh, and though it wasn't technically about atheism, it was about how full of shit Christianity was, and that was pretty close. So I checked both of the books out, and I read them over the next couple of days. Now, at the time, I was working at a pizza place that was on the verge of going out of business, and my job was to, you know, look busy in case the boss showed up. So I'm sitting in the office reading when the get-to-work bell goes off on the door, and I hastily, like, toss the book on the desk, hop up, try to act like I'm in the middle of cleaning something. Now, I know that my boss is super Christian, but I also have a great relationship with him at the time, and I've got this you know, childlike naivety about religion that assumes if a person is reasonable in one aspect of his life, he must be at least kind of reasonable in the others. So, you know, sure, he, he went to church and he wore a cross and shit, but I figured he was intelligent enough to reject creationism. But when he saw the book, he kind of freaked the fuck out and proved me wrong. Now, he wasn't the yelly type, he didn't lose his temper, but he was clearly furious to see the work of the devil burning its way into his desk and expressed a profound disappointment that I didn't believe in creationism. His exact words were, I thought you were smarter than that. I will never forget that. Like, I had just finished reading a chapter about how creationists claim that all the water for the Great Flood had been hiding in a vaporous dome above the earth and that this was what the biblical references to an antediluvian firmament were all about. That had followed a discussion about the Ark's daily production of excrement, along with the hand-waving explanation amongst creationists that God caused all the animals to hibernate through the deluge. I'd laughed myself hoarse when the author explained the kind of waves that would develop on a worldwide ocean and the unlikelihood of an unsteerable ship surviving them. And now my boss, a person I had at least a modicum of respect for, was not only endorsing those views, but insulting my intellect for rejecting them. Of course, I was far less confident in my beliefs at the time, and he was my boss, so I wasn't inclined to argue. I just kind of nodded along while he told me about all the great sacrifices that God made in sending his only begotten son to die for my sins, and then sheepishly admitted that I didn't really find his religion convincing. I, I, I didn't exactly argue, but I also didn't acquiesce. Now, for a week or so, he treated me with some mixture of disappointment and disdain, but after he'd had enough time to process my betrayal of the baby Jesus, he started asking questions about why I rejected Christianity. Thinking back on it now, I gave some embarrassingly uninformed arguments that a better-prepared apologist could have probably shredded, but neither of us really knew much about the side that we were defending, so he had little in the way of rebuttal. Over the next few weeks, this actually blossomed into an ongoing discussion about religion, and despite how strong his initial reaction was, he abandoned defending his beliefs altogether pretty early on. Instead, I became a sounding board for a lot of his doubts and distractions. I was, after all, the only person in his life that wasn't going to judge him harshly for finding fault in the teachings of the Bible. I was the only person he knew that wouldn't think less of him for expressing his doubt. This, is, this was a guy who dedicated one day of every week to congregating with people around the subject of religion, and yet here I was, the only person he could have an honest discussion about religion with. I just find this weird because religions like to brag about the way they create communities. And the more progressive apologists will even try to use that community-building aspect as a rampart to hide their doubts behind. Like, even if it's not true, just look at all these benefits. But when you build your community on a lie, what kind of community are you building? You know, my boss back then couldn't be himself around his religious peers. 
When he had doubts, he had to suppress them. When he had hard questions, he couldn't ask them. And, and uh, you add to that all the superhuman expectations of morality that Christianity imposed on him, he couldn't admit that he lusted after women or watched porn or liked alcohol or masturbated. He couldn't even be proud of his own fucking achievements. He was forced to subvert the part of himself that cussed when it got angry and enjoyed violent movies and appreciated a good boob and replace all that with a person who hated gays and defended traditional gender roles. So sure, he might have been part of a community and that his physical presence was surrounded by other people, but what's the point of belonging if you're pretending to be someone else the whole time? How much community could he possibly have if I was the only person he could be himself around? In, in that sense, religions create, if anything, anti-communities. Right? Not only do their communities fail in the all-important aspect of communing, but they also take up the space where a real community could go. You can't explore some other group that might be more accepting of your real personality because you already have Bible study with the Whitakers on Tuesday and volunteer night with the pastor's wife on Friday night and church activities all day Sunday. Somehow they're taking up the space without managing to fill it. And that's the dark secret that hides at the base of most religious communities. Everybody in them is pretending to be somebody they aren't. When people leave their insular religions, it often feels like they've sacrificed this huge community in so doing. But once you get farther away, you often discover discovered that all you lost was an illusion. If you're in a room with a hundred people pretending to be somebody they aren't, there are fewer people to get to know than there would be if you were in a room by yourself.